like is somewhat like Daniel when he was praying in Daniel chapter 10 in the third year of Cyrus's reign. He was praying and he was interceding for Israel and he encountered this extreme weariness that came on him. And in this, this, this engagement of 21 days standing in the gap for the nation of Israel, Daniel was also fasting. The, well, that's where we actually get the term Daniel fast. He was engaged in a Daniel fast, although it didn't have the Daniel fast name back then, but he named it. And in that middle of that revelation, Daniel receives a prophetic revelation from a messenger angel. Now, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 10, verse 14, because I believe that the Lord is also in this hour, as we are in 21 days, as a global Daniel who is uh, fasting and praying and interceding for Israel, that I believe God is also going to do this very same thing in those Daniels who press in. Daniel was a man who was hungry. He was hungry. He was like, Lord, I want to understand. And the angel came in response to him and it says, on the day you set your heart to understand, I was sent. But I was engaged in this battle with the prince of Persia. And, and the angel told Daniel, he says, now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days. And of course, that's the people of Israel, the Jewish people, for the vision pertains yet to the future. And so Daniel was it talks about in that passage, there was others around him, but Daniel alone received the vision. Daniel alone received the revelation. But if you're hungry, there's the invitation I believe the Lord's offering us in these 21 days, not just us, but I believe it's a worldwide invitation. If we are hungry, and if we will set our heart to understand, God will give us prophetic revelation about the nation of Israel and the end times. And so I just want to challenge you, how hungry are you for that? I know I've, I've, I, over, these, over these 14 days or so, the Lord has opened up so many things to me and things I had never seen before, or things that I've seen in part have become so clear and the end times are becoming more and more and more clear to me. It's been a huge blessing. But my question to you is, are you hungry for that? Are you like Daniel who would give himself to 21 days and say, God, give me understanding of this. Give me understanding. <clears throat> if you're not hungry, if you're not hungry, you won't receive it. But if you hunger, if you hunger I believe you will receive it. It's so important as I begin this message today, just to say this, I'm going to say it slowly so we get it, is if you don't get Israel right, your view of the end times will be wrong. If you don't get Israel right, your view of the end times will be wrong. If you don't understand Israel, you will misunderstand the end times. If you don't properly interpret Israel, you will misinterpret how God's end time plan will unfold. End time prophecy is Jerusalem centric. Understanding Israel's role is vital. It's so vital. That's just the, 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 the word, the burden on my heart today. Prophecy scholars have long said that Israel is God's prophetic clock. And some have even, and that prophetic clock tells us the day and the hour we live in, how close we are to the Lord's second coming. And some have said that the, on that clock, Jerusalem is the hour hand and the temple mount is the minute hand. Every, all end time prophecy is Jerusalem centric. And so... My, my challenge to you is how hungry are you to know God's plans for the end times? Because you're living in the end times. We've been living in the end times for at least since 1948. When, when Israel became a nation in 1948, it absolutely was, was the hallmark event that made all other end time prophecy able to come to pass. Hundreds of end time prophecies 
that were about Israel and Jerusalem could not have happened until 1948. 1967, Jerusalem is recaptured by the Jews after over 2,000 years of not occupying Jerusalem. End time prophecy, again, could now be fulfilled. See, we are living in a prophetic hour. Hope you can see that. And for the Lord to raise up five million intercessors to pray for Israel, it is truly historic. We're living in historic, prophetic moment right now. And I talked last week about, about the book of Joel, that Joel chapter 2, verse 15 through 32, that book of Joel reveals to us where we are on God's end time map. If you want to know where are you, Joel chapter 2, 15 through 32. I, would, I, I just encourage you to read Joel 2, 15 through 32, and just study it and let the Lord speak to you out of that. And what we see is Joel chapter 2, verse 17. We see the call to, to prayer and fasting. We, saw, we see the intercessors who are crying out, and they're saying, God, spare your people. Lord, spare your people. Lord, don't make your inheritance a reproach that the nation should rule over them. Lord, don't let them say, where is their God? And as the intercessors cry out, as five million intercessors cry out for Israel's deliverance and Israel's salvation, the scriptures assure us of this. I can't assure us of the timing, but I can assure you of this. God is hearing those prayers. And verse 18 says, then the Lord will be zealous and then he will have pity on his people and be zealous for his land. And what happens when that takes place? Verse 20, a northern army is coming into the land of Israel. And God says, I, it's a northern army. I'm going to explain the northern army in more detail in this message. It's a northern army that's going to attack Israel. It has not yet been fulfilled in history. It will be fulfilled soon. Is, and this prophecy, listen, is fulfilled. Your prayers for Israel are moving the heart and the hand of God to fulfill this prophetic promise. God says, I will remove the northern army and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land. It's vanguard into the eastern sea. It's rear, rear guard into the western sea. For it's, and its stench is going to come up. For it has done foul things. There is coming an invasion into the land of Israel soon. I don't know when, but soon, that God is going to defeat that northern army. And as a result of that, you can read it, and that's what we talked about last Sunday, is after this, you, you, you read, Joel says Israel's going to experience a period of peace, a period of prosperity, a period of restoration. There's coming a period of peace, restoration, and prosperity in the nation of Israel. And then we get to what we're all so familiar with, uh, as Pentecostals and Charismatics, as we get to Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 29, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So many times that's been quoted, it has not been quoted in the right context. And that doesn't mean it's wrong. I'm just saying when you see the context of when this prophecy, Joel said this prophecy would be fulfilled, it's in response to the prayers which then activates God's deliverance from Israel's enemies. Now, the Antichrist is still to come, like verse 32 says, but there's a temporary deliverance for Israel's enemies. God then says, I am not going to hide my face from you. I'm going to pour out my spirit. There's coming the most massive revival and outpouring of the Holy Spirit in human history that's coming. And Israel is the key to it all. And your prayers are the hands that turn that key to unlock God's promises. Very incredible days. And you, you, can, you can read more about that. The, this revival is going to bring in, I believe, millions and millions and millions of people. It's going to be a revival, like Terry Bennett said, the Pentecost is going to out-Pentecost Pentecost. It's going to be a revival that's not just a revival that helps people feel better and have joy. It's a revival that's going to make the bride of Jesus Christ ready. It is a bridal revival also. And that this revival is not going to dissipate. It is not going to just fizzle out like many revivals have in the past. It's an outpouring of the Spirit that's going to last until the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's incredible. So, we live in prophetic moment right now. 
We live in a prophetic hour right now. Okay, that said, I want to ask the question in this message, who exactly is this northern army? It's very important we understand this. It's very important we have understanding of this, this uh, question. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to Joel chapter 2, verse 20. Is Joel talks about this. We talked about it last Sunday. I'm going to read this so we see it. Joel chapter 2, verse 20. But God says, this is again, this is in response to the prayers, but I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, and its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its rear guard into the western sea, and its stench will arise, and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. Now, who exactly is this army that attacks Israel from the north? I'm sure you probably didn't wake up this morning going, I wonder who it is. But it's very, very important. Very important. I believe with all my heart, I am going to see this in my lifetime fulfilled. Now, some of you who are older, hopefully you'll see it too. I don't know. But I believe, and I'm, not, I'm actually getting older too, so I'm not mean, but, you know, I believe it's coming soon. I, don't, I can't say exactly when. I believe many of us are going to witness this with our very own eyes. And it's going to change the world as you know it. Now, I say all that to say, okay, pay really close attention as we get into some details. Because we're going to get into Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. It's a very complicated prophecy. Very smart scholars and very smart people who love Jesus who have, who have researched this and written books about it and, and you know, d uh, doctoral dissertations on it and all kinds of stuff, have different opinions about Ezekiel 38 and 39. So we're going to look at this very slowly. But the, I just want to say, don't zone out. Because what I'm going to show you, how th the importance of this is so, so important. Now, before we get there, I want to I show a slide here and, and just walk through just real quick. Nine similarities, nine similarities between Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 and Joel chapter 2. Remember, we talked about Joel chapter 2 last Sunday. Number one, and, and, and you can get the notes on YouTube, you can take a, a picture of that if you want, but I, I just want to encourage you, study these things. Study these things. Number one is both accounts reveal that an army is going to attack Israel from the north. Both accounts show that God is going to defeat the northern army himself. Both accounts show us that the dead bodies of the defeated army are going to be scattered across the land. Both, both passages tell us a foul smell is going to come from the carnage. Both accounts tell us God is going to pour out his spirit afterwards. Both accounts tell us that the Lord is going to remove the reproach and the shame Israel experienced from God hiding his face for almost 2,000 years after this event. Both accounts tell us the nations are going to be greatly impacted after this event. Both accounts tell us God's spirit is going to dwell in the midst of Israel after this event. And both accounts tell us that after this, Israel will know that the Lord is their God after this time. I don't believe that means every single Jew in Israel. I believe it means the beginning of a process that leads to all Israel being saved. That process could take 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know how long the process is. But I don't believe it's like all of a sudden this happens and boom, every single Jewish person living in Israel is saved. I don't believe that's going to happen. I believe it's a process that, is, that God unlocks. Okay, so in my opinion... That, in my opinion, Joel chapter 2, 15 to 32, and Ezekiel 38 and 39 are describing the same thing. I want to encourage you to go and study those passages. Especially right now, in the time we're living in, as the Lord has released this time of prayer and intercession, there is revelation for you to have in these passages. I really do believe that. These are very, very important. Even if you don't, even if you read and you're like, who is Gog and who is Magog and who is Meshach and Tubal and I don't even understand what all that stuff means. Even so, some of the names are cryptic. Some of the things are complicated. Even so, I believe God will give you understanding that's so important for the times we live in. Okay, so why, why do we need to study Ezekiel 38 through 39? I'll never forget when I 
first got, came back to the Lord, or maybe I was coming back to the Lord, it was right after the Gulf War started when Saddam Hussein was firing bombs into Israel. I was a freshman in college, and I knew enough to realize, okay, this, this is end time stuff. I'm not living for the Lord. I need to repent. And I, and I, turned my, I began to turn my life back to the Lord. Started going to First Baptist Church of Atlanta, and because I was going to school in, in Atlanta. And anyway, th that summer, I or sometime, I think it was that summer. That summer, I invited one of my Sunday school teachers there to come talk to some of my part my party friends uh, about the Bible. And this guy, he brings out this sheet, and like a bed sheet. It covered like from like here to here. It was like this massive sheet starting from the Garden of Eden all the way to the new heavens and the new earth coming down. But it had this thing about Gog of Magog in it. And my party friends were looking at me like, man, this guy has gone crazy. He's like taking one too many hits or drinks or whatever, but he's just gone crazy. I remember all of them were like, you know, they didn't want to talk to me afterwards. But now I just will never forget that moment that he mentioned. He was talking about Gog and Magog. And that was the first time I ever heard Gog and Magog. And I was like, what does Gog and Magog mean? And what relevance does that have to me you know, as a freshman in college, you know? And so anyway, as I've grown older, I realize, okay, this is a very, very important prophecy because how we interpret Ezekiel 38 and 39, how we interpret that prophecy determines our prophetic worldview. How we interpret Ezekiel 38 and 39 determines our prophetic worldview. Okay, well, what does that mean that a prophetic worldview, and what does that matter to me? Well, your, your worldview of end-time prophecy absolutely determines how you live. If you think we're living in the end times, you will live radically different than if you think the Lord's coming in like 500 years. And when you begin to see these things unfold, it, put, it puts a real sense of urgency in you to live wholehearted for God, and not to allow any complacency or lukewarmness or apathy to come into your heart or any compromise or any of that, that you would be on fire for God. Your prophetic worldview shapes the way you live. It determines how the urgency you have in your bridal preparation and your prophetic worldview is, I believe, Ezekiel 38 and 39 gives clarity to you that you need to help shape that prophetic worldview. It's a very, very important passage of Scripture. How you interpret... Ezekiel 38 and 39 clarifies your view of Israel's role in the end times. It helps you understand who, you, who the Antichrist is or is not. And it helps you understand how things are going to unfold before the Lord returns. So very, very important. Did I make that clear? No, I'm just kidding. Sadly, sadly, because it's com there, there, there's, comp there's complexity to it. Sadly, much of the church has neglected Ezekiel 38 and 39 to our own shame, to our own detriment. And we've become weaker because of that. Ezekiel 38 and 39 are vital chapters to understand. So that's why I'm going to walk through, through it today. I'm going to do a message on Tuesday that I'm going to put online, and then I'm going to finish it up next Sunday on the day of Pentecost. But let me, let me just start here and, and answer this question. What happens after this invasion? Because what I've found is if you understand what happens after this invasion... It helps you to understand, okay, this is really, really important. Number one is Israel is going to bury their enemies' dead bodies for seven months. This, this invasion is going to, God's going to destroy this army so thoroughly that it's going to take seven months to clean the land from the bodies. And in the notes they have the scriptures. I won't go through all the scriptures here. Number two, Israel is going to burn their enemies' weapons for seven years. Think about that. Their weapons are going to be burned for seven years. Number three, I've, I said this, but I'll say it again. The Lord is going to pour out His Spirit upon Israel and the nations. Number four, there's going to be a revival that is, that is net like, unlike anything that's ever taken place in Israel and the nations. Number five, millions of Jews still living in the nations are going to make Aliyah to Israel. There's like seven million or so Jews still living in the nations. And remember what I read during worship. Why is that important? Because God says 
is in the land where they get saved. Now, that's not true for every single one. We have Andy here who's a Messianic Jew who was saved in America, and there's many, many cases of that. But God has made a promise here that says, I'm going to bring them into the land, and then I'm going to pour clean water on them, and they will be clean. Aliyah is important to the nation of Israel being saved. Number six, Israel will experience a period of peace and prosperity before the Antichrist. This is before the Antichrist. So it could be 10 years. I don't know the number. I don't know how, I really have no idea how long that period of peace is. 10 years, five years, 20 years. I have no idea. And number eight, Israel's going to experience a period of restoration. Now, those are the eight things we know from those passages of Scripture that are going to happen. Now, there's also three other things that I think you can kind of deduct from this passage of what's going to happen after this to help us give an understanding. Number one is there's going to be a geopolitical vacuum that's created, and I'm going to go through this. It's going to be created after Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, and Libya are defeated in the nation of Israel. And that, that vacuum is what's going to create, that's going to pave the way for the Antichrist to establish his kingdom. There's not going to be that resistance that comes from Russia and the Middle East. Therefore, it's paving the way for the Antichrist. Number two, Islam could suffer a humiliating defeat. Because what I'm going to show you is many of these nations are Islamic nations. And they have an intense hatred to destroy Israel because uh, Israel, and especially Jerusalem, was once conquered by the, by, the, by the Islamic Empire, the Islamic Caliphate, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. And therefore, it's an offense to Allah in their mind that Jerusalem is now occupied by the Jewish people. And so, the, the Islamic, many Islamic nations are going to attack and they're going to suffer humiliating defeat that's, I believe, going to open the door for millions of Muslims to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And then number three, potentially this could be, this event could be the catalyst that allows Israel to build the third temple and resume Levitical sacrifices. That is the question so many Bible scholars have wondered, okay, and if you know anything about that 37 acre plot of land in, in Jerusalem called the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock and the al Aska Mosque are, that's the place where Muhammad supposedly ascended into heaven. If you know anything about that, you know that plot of land is the most contested piece of land in the entire earth. And to think that, that it would be in any way possible for Israel to build a Jewish temple on that Temple Mount, I mean, th that would create World War III. So the question so many prophecy scholars have asked, how in the world is that going to happen? We know from Scripture. We know from Matthew chapter 24 when the Lord said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, Daniel the prophet, know that your, know that your uh, desolation is near, then flee to the mountains because then there's coming a great tribulation. And he was quoting from Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 12, I believe. But it's the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist enthrones himself in the Jerusalem temple. In fact, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said that the Antichrist is going to go into the Jerusalem temple and he's going to proclaim himself as God. Well, you know what? There's no Jerusalem temple right now. So how is that going to happen? I believe this event is going to be the catalyst for that to happen. Okay, so let me just give you a word of caution here. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is very complicated. Okay, now I don't say that to discourage you from studying. I, know, I almost don't want to say that because you'd be like, okay, well, I'm not going to touch it. it, it it's complicated. It, um, there, there's, there's weird names. There's, there's scripture references that you're like, okay, what does that mean? But um, I've been studying, you know, I've, I've been studying end time prophecy for years and years and years. And the more that I study, the more I realize, okay, it's very important for me and all of us to be humble, to be flexible, and not to be dogmatic about our opinions, okay? So sometimes I get passionate and I get excited and it sounds like I'm dogmatic. I am not dogmatic about this. I believe it, I'm very confident about it, but again, it's complicated. So don't mistake my passion and my excitement as being dogmatic. I want the truth. I want the truth. We cannot be dogmatic, proud, or unbending as it relates to end-time prophecy. And I say this all the time when I talk about end-time prophecy. 
is more important to be ready than to be right. You can have all your eschatology correct, but if you're not prepared as a bride of Jesus Christ, what good does it do? What good does that even do? It does no good for you to have all your eschatology perfectly down pat, and yet you're not ready as a bride. So it's more important to be ready than to be right. And so when I come to this scripture, God help me, God help all of us, that we would come to these scriptures with a blank sheet of paper, and we would say, okay, I'm not bringing into this a preconceived view. I'm not bringing into this a bias. I'm coming in with a blank sheet of paper and I'm saying, Lord, you teach me. You teach me, Lord, what the truth is. I don't want to just believe what this one says, what I don't believe what I say, or that person says, you be a Berean and come in with a blank sheet of paper and say, Lord, you teach me what it says. See, um, prophecy scholars like to use the term newspaper exegesis. Has he ever heard of that term, newspaper exegesis? What that means is, don't look at the news and social media and things going on and bring what's going on in the world events and then bring that into the scriptures. That's been the place. So many people have made so many mistakes like, you know, Gorbachev is the Antichrist or, you know, I can't even think about all the different nonsense we've seen because we look at what's going on in the news and we bring that into the scriptures. Don't do that. Interpret the scriptures. Interpret the scriptures as God was speaking to the original audience, Lord, what were you saying to the original audience? Don't bring current events into the, into the scriptures because it will create all kinds of nonsense. Okay, again, so the only view that is correct is God's view. Not my view, not your view, not this person's view, not that person's view. It's God's view. Therefore, I want God's view. Even if I have to, even if I go through this and make some mistakes, I'm going to just acknowledge that because I'm after truth. I'm not after my view. Okay? A lot of prophecy scholars have their view and they get it published in, into books and they defend it for the rest of their lives because their identity is wrapped up into that. Okay? We want the truth. We want the truth. Now, just to give me an example. About, for about 15 years, I believed Ezekiel 38 and 39 would take place prior to the, to the seven-year tribulation period. For about a year, I shifted my view to think that the, this prophecy would be fulfilled at the last battle, the Battle of Armageddon. And after much prayer and much research, I have shifted my view back to my, the one I held for 15 years. I think this is going to happen prior to the, the, the beginning of the tribulation period. In other words, this, this event could happen at any moment is what I believe. I'm going to go through that and, and explain in a lot of detail why that. But my point is, is, is be, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm teaching this from a position of, okay, Lord, if I'm wrong, okay, this is my, my, uh, my promise to you. If I'm wrong about the timing, we'll get into timing in the separate message. But if I'm wrong about the timing of this and the Antichrist signs a seven-year covenant with Israel, I'm going to get up here and glad, not gladly, but tell you, okay, hey, I was wrong about the timing, okay? So I just want to maintain integrity in what we teach. I want to, you know, I have a fear of God because I'm going to give an account of the judgment seat of Christ as a teacher having a stricter judgment. I don't want to teach you anything that is wrong. So I, I spend, if you see smoke coming out of my brain, it's because I've been spending the last two weeks or three weeks just studying Ezekiel 39, reading books, reading scholars, looking at different viewpoints, what this one said, that one said, because I just want the truth. I don't want to teach you my view or this person's view or that person's view. I want the truth. What does Scripture say? That is my responsibility. Now, your responsibility, okay, listen to this. You have a responsibility. Your responsibility is not to accept what I say or to resist what I say. Your responsibility is to study what I say and seek the Lord like a Berean in Acts 17 and say, okay, Lord, I, mean, I have a, with a spirit of humility and say, Lord, is what he is teaching true? See, we have a, 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 me and Michael were chatting about this on text. We have a massive problem right now in the body of Christ because the church does not want to get into the scriptures and study for themselves. And so they just say, well, this person said this, and this person said that. I'm just, I have respect and trust for this person, therefore I'm just going to believe what he says. Don't do that. Don't do that with me. All right? 
You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility, but you have a responsibility to show yourself approved unto God as one who studies his word. The scripture says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Don't accept anything I say if you don't see it in the word of God. Don't. It's okay for you if you disagree with what I say in this message, as long as you get in there and study. You know, th this is not, what I'm talking about today is not something that in any way should create any kind of division in the body of Christ. It, it shouldn't, I mean, our eschatology sh should not create division. Ezekiel 30 and 39 should not create division. I'm saying this, my burden in this is to raise your alertness as a watchman to say, I I'm stirred by the Holy Spirit, I believe, to speak on this. And I just want to say, as a watchman, these are the things that I, th this event, a Russian Islamic evasion into the nation of Israel is coming, I believe, soon. And, as wa and if, if that, when that happens, we need, it is going to change the world as we know it. It's going to change everything as we know it. It's going to unleash the greatest outpouring of the Spirit in history. It's going to unleash the greatest revival in history. And as watchmen, we need to watch for this, okay? If I'm wrong about the timing or if I'm wrong about some things, but at least we are watching for it, there's no harm in it. But there is harm if we're not watching it and it comes suddenly and we're not prepared. Does that make sense? Yeah. Amen. Off my soapbox here. Ezekiel 38 and 39, as I'm going to unpack here, is, t is showing us that there is coming into the nation of Israel, and I'm going to walk through these nations just a bit. There's coming into the nation of Israel, I believe it's, it's a, an, an ar the army from the north is a Russian-led army that consists of an alliance between Russia, Turkey, Iran, Libya, and Sudan, and perhaps other nations. And they're going to attack Israel in the latter days. Of course, Russia's motivation is going to be economic, Turkey, Iran, and Libya and Sudan, their, their motivation is going to be, of course, driven by Islam because the Ottoman Empire had conquered Israel, established a Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, and for, I think, however many years, 400, 500 years, the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim world conquered Jerusalem. And so it is, a, it is, it is to them besmearing Allah's name to have that, uh, the Jewish people living in the land. So, th so you, you kind of understand here some of the motives. So just want to help you to alert to watch for some of those things. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this message, and I'm going to do it in this message and the next message, is I'm going to ask questions like any journalist would ask. Okay, Lord, I'm going to ask these questions. Who is going to attack? What is happening in the attack? Why are they attacking? And I'm going to answer those in this message. And then in the next message, which I believe is very, very, very important because it, it determines how we view the end times, is when is this, is this attack going to happen? That, that one's critical. And so I'm going to spend a whole message on that, do it Tuesday, and then we'll, we'll show it hopefully Wednesday, and you know, hopefully you can watch it before next Sunday. But remember, as I unpack Ezekiel 38 and 39, just remember these things. Just remember this, that Israel is God's chosen servant to bless the world and to shake empires and topple nations, or to shake nations and topple empires. God has chosen Israel as his servant. Number two, remember this, the Lord is using Israel to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. Israel is God's servant to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. And number three, Israel is key to the end time outpouring of the Spirit and worldwide revival. And then number four, a significant number of Jewish people in Israel must repent before Jesus returns. Okay, so just keep those things in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and now let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. You with me so far? Kind of a long introduction, but I know if I don't say those things, if I get into some of the details, some people will just zone out. I'm like, come back, come back. This is important to understand. Okay, Ezekiel 38 talks about this. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, in fact, I would actually say, if you're going to read Ezekiel 38 and 39, start with Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, and 39. They're all kind of centered around Israel in the last days. 
And as the, 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 Ezekiel said, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, I want to point out the first thing here. Gog is not God, even though they sound alike. Gog is a leader. Gog, uh, prophecy experts say, okay, Gog is like, would be like the title of Caesar or Tsar, some kind of, or Pharaoh, some kind of a, a, a title for a leader. So some people think that, some people think that Gog could potentially be Vladimir Putin. I'm not sure if that's true or not. We'll see. But we'll obviously see if Vladimir Putin is Gog. I kind of wonder if the prime minister or president of a nation is actually going to invade the nation of Israel. I think, in my opinion, Gog is probably going to be a military leader, not a president or prime minister, because he dies in the land of Israel. Modern day warfare, you never see a president or prime minister come into the land. So we don't know for sure. That's just kind of my thought there. Is, here's what we know about Gog is number one, he's from the land of Magog. That's important. Because when we talk about Magog, what we're trying to figure out is, okay, who is Magog? Because the leader is going to come from this nation. This nation is the one spearheading this attack. He's from Magog. He's from the remote parts of the north. Okay? And that's obviously related to Jerusalem. So what is, no, what is the most remote place from the north? Or what, is, what does the remote place of the north mean? The third thing we know is that Gog is, is a military leader. And we also know that Gog is going to die in the battle and he's going to be buried in Israel. Okay, so we know that about Gog. So who he is, we don't know. Okay, time will tell who exactly he is. Now, now I believe the next question is Magog. Who is Magog? Because Gog is from the land of Magog, which is a geographic territory, uh, verse 3815. Gog is, a, is from the land of Magog, which is in the remotest parts of the north. Okay, catch that. Gog is from Magog. Magog is in the remotest parts of the north related to the nation of Israel. The reason, when we get into Magog, I'm going to spend the most time on Magog. I won't spend as much time on the others. But the reason that's important is because we're trying to identify, is this a Russian-led invasion or a Turkey-led invasion? So, by far, the Russia view is the most popular among Bible scholars. It's the, no doubt, almost all Bible scholars, not almost all, but a number, numerous prophecy scholars believe that Magog is Russia or the former Soviet Union. Uh, the, the Expositor's Bible Commentary says this about Magog. It's the land of the Scythians. It's a mountainous region around the Black and Caspian Seas. I've got a lot more detail in the notes here, but... It, it seems to me, just from the study that I did, that Magog is referring to Ukraine, southern Russia, perhaps parts of Asia, uh, and then some would even say parts of Turkey. But it, it was really interesting doing a bunch of this research. I don't know if you've heard of Joel Rosenberg, uh, who writes non, or fiction books. He spent 20 years researching Ezekiel 38 and 39, and he went to a museum, it's kind of like the Smithsonian Museum in, in Russia, in Moscow. And as he's going there, he starts seeing there's like, there's like all these cases of glass set out that shows that the Scythians, who uh, Josephus said was Magog, showing that the Russians, that, that the Scythians were in fact Russian. Okay, so that, that to me showed, okay, that's a pretty, that's a pretty significant thing there, that, that Magog is... Uh, is Russia. Um, anyway, I got a lot more notes in the, uh, in the uh, or a lot more detail in the notes. So I asked ChatGPT, okay, have you heard of ChatGPT? Okay, artificial intelligence. Who knows where that's going, but it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty handy tool. I asked ChatGPT, okay, who are the Scythians and what modern day nations do they refer to? And this is what ChatGTP said. Today, the descendants of the Scythians are not known to exist as a distinct people or nation. However, their legacy can be seen in the art, culture, and history of the many nations that once lay in their territories, including Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. So, again, ChatGPT tells us 
artificial intelligence has to be right that, that the Scythians are Russia. Okay. Now, other scholars say that the Scythians were not Russia, but Turkey. In fact, Joel Richardson lays out in his book, The Mid-East Peace, why, how, I think he lists like nine different references of commentaries and Bible dictionaries that says that uh, Magog is Turkey. And so, here's my bottom line. Really smart scholars who love Jesus, who are very intelligent, who've researched this for decades, have a different opinion, okay? So, what I want to ask the question is, okay, we, and let's go ahead and show the map here. I, I got a map here just to give you a, a map of, g give me a thumbs up when you see it, of the Scythians, okay? Is, you see the Scythians um, were part of Ukraine, southern Russia, Turkey, and even part of Asia, okay? So it's kind of hard just to look at from historical documents and stuff like that to know, okay, the Scythians are these nations. But I think if you look in the context of Ezekiel 38 and 39, is you, it helps us understand who really the Scythians are. And look, let's turn in your Bibles to uh, Ezekiel 38, verse 15. Is the first context clue is it says, Gog is going to lead this army from, the, from his place out of the remote parts of the north. And he's going to, and then in 39.2 he says, the Lord is going to take you up, talking about Gog, from the remote parts of the north and bring you against the mountain of Israel. So we've got to ask the question, what is the, what would be more remote north from Jerusalem? Would it be Ankara in Turkey or would it be Moscow in Russia? And so and the, the capital of Turkey is 575 miles north of Jerusalem, and Moscow is 1,660 miles north of Jerusalem. In other words, it's three times greater. So to me, in my opinion, what fits that context better is Russia as opposed to Turkey being Magog. Um, a second context clue is we know in Ezekiel 38, 12 through 13, we know this, that this invasion is coming because Ezekiel tells us Gog wants to capture, spoil, seize, plunder, take the Jewish people's cattle, goods, carry away their silver and their gold. Russia's motivation is economic. Or Russia's motivation would be economic. Turkey's motivation, as President Erdogan has said, is we want to reclaim the Ottoman Empire. We want to recapture Jerusalem for Allah. Turkey's primary motivation would not be economic, but based on Islam. That makes sense? So while there's strong cases that it could be Russia or Turkey, I lean towards, because of the context, I lean towards Gog being the land of Magog being Russia. Time will tell. I'm looking for both. I'm actually looking, okay, is it Russia or is it Turkey? I'm looking for both, but I lean personally towards it being Russia. Okay, are you still with me? Okay, we got... Going through the details, you know, I'll, I'll speed up on the other ones. That one was important. The second question is, who is Rosh? There's a huge debate about Rosh, and I've got some of the debate in my notes. It's, it's way too much of a debate to get into in this message, and I'm just not going to go there for the sake of time. But if you want to understand that debate, you can look at my notes some. Okay, the next, the next group of nations, Ezekiel 38, 2, it says that Gog leads the nations represented by Meshach and Tubal. Some people believe that's related to Russia. I believe that if you really study it, I believe those two countries are, are talking about Turkey. So it's, I believe that's talking about Turkey. So we've got now, we've got Russia and we've got Turkey. The, the next thing, as you see, is in Ezekiel 38.5, it talks about Persia, Ethiopia, and Put. And these nations are pretty easy to define. Persia is obviously Iran. Iran is, by the way, it's not Iran, okay, to us Southerners, you pronounce it Iran, all right? So, Iran is when you, when you start jogging somewhere, all right? Iran is how you produce that, pronounce that nation. So, it's not Iran, it's Iran. And it takes a little bit of time to say that. But as you know, Iran wants to produce a nuclear bomb. And in fact, some have said they would have a bomb by May or June. 
And some have even said they already have one. I don't know when that is. I'm not sure when that's going to take place. But we know that Iran hates Israel with a passion. In fact, we saw uh, just a couple months ago, or even a month ago, when, when the Jews were celebrating Holocaust and Remembrance Day, the president of Iran said, if you do one thing, if you take one wrong step, in, after it was dealing probably with the Temple Mount, if you take one wrong step in this, we are going to bomb Tel Aviv and Haifa. I mean, Iran, of all the nations that hate Israel, Iran is probably the one nation that hates Israel the most. So Iran, it's, it's amazing to me that Ezekiel, I mean, what is that, 2,500 years ago, could, and, and, and some of you ever doubt, is the scriptures true? You can look at Ezekiel 38 and 39 and say, my goodness, this is so accurate, that Ezekiel could look out 2,500 years ago and say, Persia is going to attack Israel, and to see that today, that, you know, it doesn't take a rocket science note, that could actually happen. Ethiopia is, uh, Ethiopia is H ancient Kush and refers to Sudan, which is Islamic. Put refers to Libya and other northern parts of Africa, which again is Islamic. And then in Ezekiel 38 and 39, or Ezekiel 38 verse 9, it also mentions Gomer and Beth Torgama, which both refer to modern day Turkey. So just, uh, let's show the next slide here, this table here of what nations we can expect that are going to attack Israel, I believe soon, I believe soon, is number one, Magog is Russia, perhaps Turkey, time will tell. Number two, Meshach is Turkey. Number three, Tubal is Turkey. Four is Persia. Persia is Iran. Kush is Sudan. Put is Libya. Gomar, Gomer, not Gomer Pyle, but Gomer is Turkey, and Bo Beth Torgama is Turkey. Okay, so you can just look at, I mean, those things could happen. I mean, can you not see an alliance between Russia, Turkey, and Iran forming? In fact, they had a meeting on April the 2nd, 2023, through April 2nd, and April 2nd through April 3rd, 2023, when when uh, Turkey, Iran, and uh, Russia went to Moscow, we're talking about Syria. So absolutely, no doubt, you can see this happening. It's beginning to unfold. Now, let's get into the question of the what. What is really going on in Ezekiel 38 and 39? It is a Russia-Islamic invasion. And you know these nations I mentioned uh, Iran and Turkey and Libya and Sudan, all of those nations are almost majority Muslim. And so you can see this beginning to form, this, this Islamic attack coming against the, the nation of Israel. And so here's, what, here's what's so beautiful, is the Lord says, the Lord says about this army, I am putting hooks into their jaws. This is not them coming up with their own plan. And, well, it is to a degree. But the Lord is also using that and putting hooks into their jaws and drawing them in because God is going to show himself strong to the nations. You remember Elijah and, and the prophets of Baal. And Elijah had a divine confrontation with the prophets of Baal. And they were trying to say, who is God? And Elijah was saying, okay, show us your God. And they could do nothing. And Elijah called fire down from heaven and said, this is the true God. We're coming into a moment of another divine confrontation here on the mountains of Israel between Allah and the God of Israel through Jesus Christ. And this time we're going to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is the most supreme God. And God is going to defeat this army that invades Israel, and God says, I am going to be sanctified in the sight of many nations. I'm going to be hallowed in the sight of many nations. I am going to be glorified in the sight of many nations. And then they will come to know that I am the Lord their God. Not only Israel, but the nations. I mean, can you imagine what would happen if all of these nations started, this, this massive storm cloud covers the land of Israel, and helpless and hopeless Israel trying to defend this by herself, and all of a sudden, in one hour, God defeats this army, what the nations would say. If they watched it on CNN, Fox News, or Al Jazeera, and they watch it, 
And they say, they see the God of Israel has shown forth his power. And it says, then the nations are going to know that I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One in Israel. Can you imagine what that's going to do? You think about communism. I know Russia isn't communist officially anymore, but they're represented, their religion would be atheism. And the Muslims coming in with Islam. And God says, neither communism, atheism, or Islam is the true God. I am the Lord God. I am the Holy One in Israel. And God brings down the strongholds of atheism and humanism in one moment. And God brings down and begins to bring a, this massive hit upon uh, even the strongholds of false religions. And God begins to show himself, I am the true God, the most high God through Jesus Christ. And you can just imagine just the harvest that would come as the nations watch this display of God's holiness and his glory. Incredible. I love what it says in, in, in verse 38, verse 18 and 19 through 20. God says, when on the very day Gog attacks, on that very day, God says, I will rise up in my zeal. I will rise up in my anger. And he says, my presence will be so felt in that nation. It's going to cause a great earthquake. Think about that. It's not just an earthquake that happens because of a fault line. It's an earthquake that happens because of God's invading presence. And that earthquake begins to shake not only Israel, but nations around. It's a great, massive earthquake. And God destroys this army on the very day of their attack. God destroys them not only with an earthquake, but there's civil, in, there's infighting, and there's civil war, and there's also, the, 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 there's also hell and fire and brimstone. God rains this down upon these nations who invade his land. Because remember, Israel is God's land. Israel is God's land. The prophets say that. Israel is God's land. So that is, that is the, the what of this attack. And I've already kind of answered the why, so I'll just go through this real quickly. But the why of the attack, Russia's motivation would be economic. That's, that's pretty straightforward from Ezekiel 38, 12 to 13. Russia's motivation is economic. We want to capture this for a, a strategic stronghold in the Middle East. The Islamic alliance, of course, is driven by Islam because... As we know, that once a territory is conquered by Islam, it besmears all his name for another nation to have uh, any place or any place of conquering those or having uh, established their reign in that nation. And you know, Jerusalem is the third holiest site of Islam. And on the Dome of the Rock, the Dome of the Rock, the al Aska Mosque on the Temple Mount, that, that is the place where they believe that Muhammad ascended. So that is the, the chief battleground in all of the earth is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And so they're driven. If, you, if, you've, if you've seen any of Erdogan, President Erdogan from Turkey, any of his, some of his speeches, it's very, very clear he has absolute ambitions to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. In fact, he said that, that Jerusalem for us is a red line. And he said that, in this city that we had to leave in tears during the First World War, it is still possible to come across traces of the Ottoman resistance. So Jerusalem is our city, a city from us. And when President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, Erdogan said Israel is an occupying and terror state. And he called on all the countries to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine, saying that Jerusalem is the red line. Once you cross that line, you've hit the point of no return. So clearly, the motivation of, the, of those nations that partner with Russia are going to be the nation, are going to be Islamic, an Islamic uh, motivation. So let me just bring this to a close. So we know this. Again, I just want to encourage you, read these notes. Study these scriptures because what I believe we are very close to seeing happen is we are very close to seeing this northern army of Russia, Turkey, Iran, 
Sudan, Libya, perhaps other nations, were very close to seeing this, na these, this coalition of nations, this Islamic jihad against Israel, which would culminate the jihad that's been going on against Israel since 1948. God is going to move to bring this to a culmination. Not to say there won't be future jihads, but to bring this to a culmination on the mountains of Israel. And he's going to show the world, just like Elijah did on, the, on Mount Carmel, he's going to show the world that I am the Lord Most High, not Allah. I am the Lord Most High, not communism. And I am the Lord Most High, not secular humanism or atheism. And this event is going to lead to the greatest harvest in human history, the greatest outpouring of the Spirit of God in human history, human history far greater than the book of Acts, great power, great uh, anointing, signs and wonders is going to lead to the bride being made ready. It's going to lead to, to the gospel going forth in nations that have been closed out. I believe this time of prayer and intercession for the nation of Israel, five million intercessors laboring in prayer for the nation of Israel are moving God's hand and heart to activate end time prophecy. I assure you, these prayers will not go unanswered. God is going to take the incense that has been stored up in these incense bowls and he's going to pour out the heavenly incense with fire and with lightning and with power and he's going to fulfill what the intercessors have been praying for. God is going to do it. You are an Esther who's standing before the king in this very moment interceding for the king to say, God, spare your people. Deliver your people. Do not let your people be in her a reproach that the nation should rule over them. God is going to be zealous for his land and have pity on his people. What historic times we live in. This coalition of nations, this alliance of nations is beginning to form. I believe we're not far from that. And the church needs to get ready because the harvest that's going to come from this will be unlike anything we've ever seen in human history. God help us be ready. Amen. Father, we just come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just pray for the body of Jesus Christ that we would that we would be ready Lord my even even during worship my burden was the nets that would bring in the fish of this harvest are broken because of the, the disunity in the body of Christ we are going to need everybody fully equipped for this harvest that's coming in. It's going to be massive. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you would raise up forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah, friends of the bridegroom. Lord, you would raise up, Lord, prophetic messengers. You would raise up apostolic vessels. You would raise up evangelists. You would raise up teachers and pastors. Lord, you would raise up an army, Lord. Raise up an army that would be prepared to bring in this harvest that is coming soon and very soon in these days in which we live. The younger people absolutely need to be equipped because it's going to happen in your lifetime. I pray, Lord, for the younger people to be fully equipped as these messengers, these, these students of the Word of God that would study to show themselves approved. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would raise up these messengers, Lord, in the name of Jesus, who would study to show themselves approved unto God a workman that needs not be ashamed. If you're 40 or younger, I just want you to stand up. I just want to pray for you. Okay. I just want to pray that God would just pour out His Spirit on you. Father, I just pray, even those listening online, I pray for those 40 and younger. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Just receive right now. Just receive. Lord, would you pour out your Holy Spirit?
Lord, would you anoint these who are younger to be a forerunner vessel, whether they're called as a prophet, apostle, evangelist, teacher, pastor. I just pray, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, Lord, you would just, you would just truly, God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Lord, I believe and I sense that, that, that several here really, really are called to be leaders in this harvest that's coming. Lord, some are even called to have a heart for the Middle East. Lord, I just pray that you would open doors for them wherever you would send them in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for that anointing upon them, Lord. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would anoint these leaders to be those who study to show themselves approved unto God. A workman who needs not be ashamed. Hallelujah, Lord. I just want to challenge those who are younger. I believe the word of the Lord to you is study to show yourself approved. The approval from the Lord is going to come out of your study. The, the, approval, from the, wor the, the approval from the Lord is going to come from your study. It's, it's so important that you get deep into the Word of God. God has called you. God has called you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord just put Stephen and Bryce on my heart to just, just to say, I believe both of you are called as leaders in this end time move of the Holy Spirit, as forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And um, I just believe God is wanting to, is jealous to raise you up as that leader. And it's so important just for both of you guys, not the other one's not standing up as applied to, but the other, but just you two, just the Lord pointed out is that it's so important for both of you to study to show yourself approved unto God. It's to really, 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 really get in the Word and to become just so deep, 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 deep in the Word. It's very, very important for you guys. Um, just, just, I feel like there's a real leadership call there on your, on your lives. Not to say the others don't, just these are the ones that the Lord put on my heart just for this time. And, and just, just the, the Lord is going, the, the approval, the approval is going to come by study. The approval is going to come. God's going to approve you as you study. The, the studying to show yourself approved unto God, is, is that, that studying is going to what be that, that, that the Lord approves. And Stephen, I just felt like, as I was saying this, that God's um, going to give you a real heart for the Middle East. And I just believe even over these 21 days, the Lord is stirring up your heart for the Middle East, your heart for Israel, but I do believe God is going to give you that heart for the Middle East and that I believe God's going to open a door even to go to the Middle East in his time and his season, but not as a tourist, but as a messenger of the Lord in his time and in his way. I do believe God has a place, uh, a real work for you in the Middle East, uh, even into Asia, and that the Lord, even into India, the Lord's going to anoint you as a, as a pioneer, even an apostolic pioneer, to pave and prepare the way in those nations. You're called to the nations. It doesn't mean you're moving to the nations, but you're, you, God's called you to the nations. There's a call of God on you to the nations. And you're going to go as an apostolic sent one in the spirit and the power of Elijah as a prophetic witness to prepare the way of the Lord. To prepare the way of the Lord. There is the call... Uh, just uh, Stephen and Bryce, just come down. I want to just pray over you guys this, this scripture here. This is the call of God on both of your lives. I don't, I'm not saying you're going to the Middle East, just him, but just want to pray. Uh, yeah, you got to be. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to pray. This, this is what just this scripture verse just came to me. Uh, just, just several here. Is Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. I believe the Lord is marking you both. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest. 
and give yourselves no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You're marked by this calling. I believe this is just the beginning of you guys walking in this calling. It's a pray, it's a it's an intercessory call for the nation of Israel, but it's also an intercessory call for the bride to be made ready and the nations to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. But here's the scripture the Lord gave me for you guys. Isaiah 62, verse 10. The Lord says to you, just receive this right now, go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, Lift up a standard over the people. Behold, the Lord is proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughters of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. And behold, his reward is with them and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And, and the Lord will raise you up to be a voice that will call out this city, a city that's sought out and not forsaken. So, Lord, just, we just pray, Father, that you would do it for Stephen and for Bryce Lord, in the name of Jesus, you would set them apart and release your holy fire upon them, Lord. Just take them deep, deep into preparation, deep into the fire of the Holy Spirit. Deep, Lord, deep, deep, deep of that, Lord, I pray. Deep there we cry out, Lord. Let the fire of the Lord burn in their hearts as that forerunner messenger, that forerunner messenger. Stephen, I feel like just as dad pioneered pathways in Africa and set up this work in Africa, that you're called to set up a similar type work, a similar type work in the Middle East, Asia, India, that God would open doors for you as he unfolds it. But I believe you're, you're called to do a similar work that dad has done in Africa in those nations, that the Lord is going to anoint you as an apostolic spearhead and pioneer to establish those works in those, in those areas, that the Lord's going to open doors for you in those areas, in his time and in his season. And I, I don't think it's meaning you're going to move there. I just think God's just going to open up doors for you to establish almost what Dad did in life school in Africa in, in those areas. Those, the Lord's opening those areas to you. So, Lord, open those doors, Lord. Open those doors, Lord, for Stephen and his, in your time, and in your season, we cry out. We cry out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's just stand real quick. You guys can sit down. Let's stand real quick. I want to pray for us in person and online. Uh, yeah, yeah. For us in person and online, I want, us to, I want to pray real quick. Just receive that God would, that these 21 days of prayer for Israel are not going to end on the 28th. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep this burden in our heart until the Lord returns. And it's not, it doesn't mean it's the only thing we pray for, but, but I just believe that Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, the Lord is stirring this up in this. Just receive a fresh stirring of the Lord in this. Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. Just receive, that's you, that's me. Chris, I feel like that's you. God's called you to Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. The Lord is going to just anoint you as a watchman to pray and to intercede. There's coming a real spirit of prayer upon you, Chris, that you're going to intercede and you're going to stand as an intercessor before the Lord to pray according to Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. On your walls, O Jerusalem. Patricia, that anointing is on you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. That anointing is on you, Patricia. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. I, I, like I said in my first message, this prayer is not only, it's, it's number one, praying for Israel. Number two, it's praying for the bride to be made ready. Number three, it's praying for the Great Commission. And so it's, it's massive. It's basically, you're an intercessor marked for prayer for the, for the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Can you get the uh, young kids in? I just feel the spirit of prophecy on me. Get the young kids in. <clears throat> Is Anna here? Okay, I have a word for Anna. Thank you, Lord. I may have to just share it with her in private. Okay. And the Lord gave me a word for you that... Uh, Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, that you're, you have a real, the Lord has anointed you as an Anna in the end times. And that the Lord is going to anoint you, Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. That's a call of God on your life. Uh, Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, I want to encourage you to read that. But that is, a call, that, that, is a, that is a call of God on your life. The Lord has set you apart for that very call. On your walls of Jerusalem, I'm not saying you have to walk in this today, but... On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You're called to prepare the way of the Lord, Anna. You're called to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm sure. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, just before we stop the streaming, I just want to say one more thing here, is we are, we want to take up an offering for Israel, and, um, and we're going to give it to our friend Shmuel Birnbaum in Bat Yam, right outside of Tel Aviv, he pastors a church there. And... I just, I just feel the Lord stirring us and, and wanting to, to, I believe we're in a season right now where the Lord is wanting to emphasize, obviously emphasize to us the importance of Jerusalem and Israel and his prophetic plans. And the Lord says, the Lord says that I will bless those who bless you. Again, this is going to sound like I'm a prosperity preacher. I'm not. But I do believe right now the Lord is, is saying in this, for this particular offering, okay, not... I'm not saying every single time we give, I'm, you know, test me in this. this is for this specific offering, I feel like the Lord is saying to us, test me now in this and see if I will not bless you based upon Genesis 12, verse 3. And I believe the Lord wants to even encourage us and challenge us to give generously to Israel. And that in, in giving, I, I believe this prophetically, that the Lord is... Now, again, don't give unless the Lord tells you to give, and don't give unless the Lord gives you what the amount to give. Okay, just take what I'm saying back to the Lord in prayer. But I believe that areas of breakthrough you need, whether it's financial, other areas that you need, I believe that as you, as you are led by the Holy Spirit to give into Israel, God is going to bless you in some area that you have been asking and waiting and in need of breakthrough in. I really do believe that. So just want to encourage you, whether you're in person or online, if you want to give online, you can give at restorationlife.org. And I just want to encourage you to seek the Lord about what he would have you give and to just be generous in that. And then also, just, just, just take note, okay, I gave... You know, and again, this is not being greedy, but just I think the Lord wants to show us the importance of blessing Israel, that there is a blessing when we bless Israel. I believe the Lord is going to do that. So amen and amen. We can end the uh, online stream there. Thank you so much for paying attention through the tedious Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Beth Torgama, all that stuff. So thank you so much. Remember the tithe in the offering basket is there in the back. And... Um, 
A couple of announcements. We are not, um, we, we felt like the Lord was saying not to do house church this month because the fast, the praying time ends. I keep saying the fast. I'm only, not, I'm only fasting like two or three times. But the prayer time is, uh, 